What's going on, everybody? It's the Big Dog Podcast, and I'm Josh Wilson, and we're in the studio this week with Jonathan Mack, as usual. What's up, Jonathan? Nothing much, just hanging out. Nice. Jonathan's got a couple questions for us. We're going to do a, a quick Q&A, so let's jump right in, Jonathan. What do you got? Yeah, so recently Congress just decided to make daylight savings time permanent. Just passed that unanimously, so we're going to put an end to the uh, clock shifting. Yeah, I mean, I think that in my mind, I enjoy the fallback, right? And so now we've sprung forward and we're just going to stay here. Um, the reality is, though, with, with, with most things that, like, the government passes, injects into society, whatever, I don't know that it would actually impact me at all or us at all. It, it, I kind of just do what I got to do regardless. If it's dark out, if it's light out, I'm going to get done what, what needs to get done. So I really don't know enough about it to to have like a major opinion. I think about it as literally being indifferent. You know, this, you know, a couple weeks ago, um, we sprung forward, right? And that night was when the truck got broke into. We were traveling for a volleyball tournament. So it's not like I'm a teenager or I'm in college and I'm like, oh yeah, we're going to fall back. We get an extra hour of sleep or, oh man, I'm losing it out. Like my mind just doesn't work that way anymore. You know, I'm going to take advantage of every hour that is the hour that needs to be addressed. So springing forward, falling back doesn't matter to me at all. Yeah. I mean, you and I, uh, wake up ridiculously early, get into the office much, typically much earlier than, uh, everybody else so I don't think that the sleeping portion of it matters to us much yeah the weird thing you know it's funny so I used to be like super early riser I will say in the last year and I've always been a fan of that and been fine with it but the last year my body started just like not waking me up at four in the morning anymore and I've kind of just let that ride like it's I haven't been forcing myself up if I wake up I wake up and I'm up but if I can chill for a few minutes and fall back asleep and my body will let me fall back asleep, I'll do it. Whereas it used to be like, oh, I'm up, time to go, time to roll. No, I mean, I'm not getting in for the in here to the gym even usually till eight o'clock. And I, I don't know why. I'm just trying to pay attention to it. You know, people are like, successful people win the day, 4 a.m., head start. Yeah, I believe that too. I, I do, and I think there is a head start there. But I also think if you're making the best use of your time, period, it almost doesn't matter when that work is getting done, um, as long as you're being as efficient as possible with it. And if my ass is telling me to stay asleep, and it's never told me that in 40 some odd years, I'm gonna pay attention and stay asleep. Yeah, I am an 80 year old man trapped in a 24 year old body. <laughs> I wake up every morning at 4.30 to go to the bathroom and just stay awake. After being up 10 times throughout the night to go to the bathroom? Yes. Yeah, that's funny. That's funny. What do we got next? So next, we have a couple of different questions okay. since the news is what it is at the moment. Yeah, what have you been care. watching recently? Um, what have I been watching recently? So I'm a big fan of The Blacklist, all right, on TV. I think it's um, James Spader. I think he plays yeah. Raymond Reddington. Um, tremendous. So they released a bunch of episodes um, earlier this year. So I've been watching that a little bit. Um, Walking Dead, I'm still following along. I don't know that I'm a huge fan of The Walking Dead anymore, but I was a big fan long enough that I'm going to see it through. And I think this is their final season. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, I've been watching those as they come out. Those are really the only two shows that I kind of stay current on as far as, like, new release and and by current, meaning if the episode drops, I will um, consume it within a month of it coming out, right? Yeah. I'm rare. I'm not like, oh, it dropped Sunday night, let me watch it Monday morning, or I'm watching it Sunday. I will tell you, though, the two shows that I absolutely recently have done that with and love every bit of it. Yellowstone and 1883. Two of my favorite shows right now. Um, tremendous. Those we watched in real time. You know, when the episodes released, uh, Devin and I both really enjoyed it. And I didn't want to wait till the next day to watch it. I, I needed to see really, re really well written, 
a lot of people are like, oh, it's too evil and there's so much pain and all that. I'm like, yeah, this is a good show. This is a good show. I like it. Man, it plays into my cowboy, you know, vibe that I want. So yeah, it's understandable. People no, no. like to watch shows that they see themselves in. I used to. Yeah. I used to watch Walking Dead like when it came on AMC, like yeah, yeah. Sunday nights, like live, and then. I stopped probably right before I got to college just because they started introducing some weird stuff. Came yeah. back to it to watch it on Netflix and they somehow revived it. Yeah. I don't really get it. The thing that bothers me, and I don't think it's good because I'm 24 years old and right. like this, but why and who are these people that are just deciding everything needs a remake or like a remixed version of what it already was? It's like there's no creativity to either like sitcom or we're just going to remake something else that already worked so there's well here's the thing so I think I said a couple weeks ago that there's no unique problem right like somebody's had your problem before there's already a solution that someone's experienced with it I almost think that with entertainment in a lot of ways it's gotten that way too like how many different variations of the same story can you tell one thing that's been interesting that I've been hearing a little bit of chatter about, I have not read a single article, I have not watched the show, um, I've just seen some in some random scrolling, some people having some posts and talking about it, is the remat, remac, the remake of Fresh Print Prince of Bel-Air. I knew you were going to say it. So I haven't seen anything about it, but they were all pissed off and they're talking about how um, you know Carlton's a a drug addict and you know in the new one and who was who was the sister um why can't i think of her name uh, uh, oh gosh it wasn't candace was no. no what the hell how can i not think of her name it's really disrespectful because we remember Aunt it's Aunt super disrespectful Uncle because i had the biggest crush on her too um Damn, I can't think of her name. They're talking about she's a hoe and like all this stuff. I mean, it's just, it's it was kind of nutty how they're talking about with the remake of it. But again, I'm like, I don't, you don't remake Fresh Prince of Bel Air. You know what I mean? Like, you don't remake that. Janice. The, Janice Smith. It was Janice? Uh, yep. And so it's like, you don't, you don't remake that show. It's got to be a different show. Don't even give it the same name. I know they tried to mix it up. They just call it Bel Air or whatever now. But you got the same characters, similar plot line. Yeah. Like, I mean, it, like leave it be. I loved The Fresh Prince of Bel Air. I thought that was well, great. I think we spoke about off, uh, off air about how I felt about it. And I think it comes down to something very simple. The Fresh Prince of Bel Air was very much so a situational comedy and or like, it was shot in a certain way that it didn't make everything dramatic. This mm -hmm. new Bel Air show is shot like his general hospital. <laughs> so it takes so much of the general humor. Like, yeah. the Fresh Prince of Bel Air forced you to think about relevant social issues because they were tucked within the context of being funny yeah. or a storyline that you were invested in. Right. Now it just takes very. Uh, very obvious social issues and just kind of pushes them in your face and it's like hey remember these characters that you love well now they're talking about things that you care about in a serious way it's like it just ruins the entire show for me yeah I don't want that shit like I wanted I liked it how it was I mean but I guess that's most people and then the last thing that I probably have um, watched a little bit of that I enjoyed Netflix came out the new season of Ozark and I don't know if you watch Ozark. I've seen the first um, three seasons, but I, I haven't watched the fourth. I really like that show. And um, it's entertaining. You know, I don't... I like to watch stuff that I don't have to think a whole lot about. And usually I'm doing something different, like, wh while I'm watching it. You know? And so I just... I want to be entertained. And um, a little bit of suspense. See what happens. But I'm not going to lie. A lot of times i got to go back because I'll miss a part. Yeah, I can't do, uh, like, suspenseful TV shows. I can only do them every so often. I just sit down and watch, like, comedies. Yeah. Like, really, like, I'm big into, like, the topical stuff, like, i.e. your South Park, Family right. Guy. Right, really yeah, yeah, yeah. Stuff that kind of <laughs> talks about social issues that are going on right now, and South Park is kind of addressing everything that's in the news. And it's funny because I used to watch old episodes, like, 
wow, this Britney Spears episode is wild. Right. Like, I don't really get why they're joking about her shaving her head, and now I'm seeing, like, oh, they were always talking about her. They were her always present. talking about real stuff. The Devin and the kids have started watching. Devin's always been into, like, I swear, she's probably just going to murder me one day. If anything ever happens to me that's suspect, look at my wife. Investigate my wife. Because she started watching and listening to, like, these true crime podcasts and these shows and then her and the kids I don't know the name of it it's old like it's an older show it's not CSI but they're like behavioral analysts for the FBI ooh is, is it Bones? no Bones. it might be called True Crime I don't know but they've been watching this and it's just like a 35 minute show and they're they're knocking it out watching this I'm like this is jacked up it's a mess what are y'all what are y'all plotting for like what are we thinking about See, right now i'm a little bit worse because i sit like you just heard walking in just mm -hmm. in my daily life i sit and do things i need to do but i listen to conspiracy theory podcasts oh, no, I so i'm just that. sitting here thinking the government's evil etc i just want to just do what i need to do and move on speaking of next question moving on What's the most difficult dog that you've had to train? Because we don't often talk about dogs. That's kind of a prerequisite before yeah. we started the podcast that we wanted it to be something different. Yeah. But I yeah. think it's time to give the people a taste of some of your experiences as a dog trainer. Yeah, so I think probably single-handedly the most difficult dog um, I've ever trained was a Sharpay. And... Um, we, we've had they're not popular like labs and german shepherds and golden retrievers and stuff like that so it's not like we've seen hundreds and hundreds of sharpays over the years out of the thousands of dogs we've trained we've probably seen a half dozen maybe every one of them been tough but there was one in particular that just um you know the dog was tough um but the poor dog honestly was just was just off the dog wasn't well and um, to be completely honest with you, I mean, we ended up refunding the client. You know, it's it was a combination of owner and dog. And I didn't, I, at the end of the day, I don't think that there was help for that particular dog. I mean, this dog would just be walking along. Next thing you know, just start attacking the owner in their own legs. Pop, 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 pop. Like going nuts. Like, what in the head? Like what? What are we doing right now? And like normal dog <laughs> that they're not looking to do that to their owners. Like they and they've had this dog since a puppy. It just <coughs> it, it was a it was a rough, rough scenario. But Sharpays in general um are tough. Uh that particular dog, I think chemically just something wasn't wasn't right. So super tough. Um aside from that, you know, bloodhounds are notoriously difficult, a lot of fun to work with. But man, they're really, really tough. And you get any of the the other like guardian type breeds, you know, they're just very independent. You know, instinctually they know what their purpose is. And so when you get a client who's got this dog that should be roaming and overseeing, and now all of a sudden it's like, hey, I live in my third story condo or apartment. And I got this dog because it was an adorable puppy. It looked like a little teddy bear. Yeah, well, that joker's huge now, and he's wondering why you don't have a farm for him to run around and look over sheep and llamas and shit. Like, what What are, what are we doing? Yeah. And so those dogs are typically tough, but they always do really, really well. It's just a matter of, and honestly, of all, the difficulty of all those dogs I'm just mentioning, the owners are substantially more difficult. The people are always harder. You know, yeah. than the dogs. That's a common phrase that I've heard, but do you remember what you told me when I was an intern, first started working here? I was sitting up because the way that it used to be set up, you remember training room, mm -hmm. stairs up, and it was just your office up above, and that's where I would work out of. Yeah. First thing you told me, walked in the office, you said, here's your desk, here's your computer, work everything off of here, just beware, we have a husky downstairs, oh, we're yeah. training, and they're a little loud. <laughs> that dog's going to be loud. Yeah. And huskies, I mean, huskies aren't easy either, um, you know, but we work with a ton of huskies. And overwhelmingly, they do incredibly well. They just, they just really, they make you earn it. And they're going to tell you about it the whole time. Oh, yeah. They're going to tell you about it when they're excited. They're going to tell you about it when they're not excited. Uh, they're going to tell you about it when they understand. They're going to tell you about it when they don't understand. They are just going to 
tell you about it. The funniest thing is when an owner likes to likes to argue with their dog or thinks that when they're speaking to their dog it's a real conversation and they have a husky and then it's like, oh, they can talk your head off for hours. <laughs> yeah, they ain't worried about you. <laughs> they're not worried about you. But I will tell you though, once the husky understands um, what's required and what those expectations are, incredible dogs. They're, they're fun to work with. They're fun to train. They're fun to do life with. Um, but until you get that that understanding and that relationship in place between the owners and the dogs, oftentimes it's an absolute train wreck. I mean, that's, that's any dog, Huskies in particular, though, can be tough. I mean, hasn't there been like three different movies about the bond between Huskies and their owners? Or am I mistaken? I mean, they're just, I, that's probably more because of they're photogenic, they look good on video, and everybody. I mean, people don't get Huskies because of their temperament and behaviors. That That is not why people buy Huskies. They buy Huskies because they see them as puppies and they're adorable. Most people who have beagles don't have beagles because of their demeanor and their attitudes and their work ethic and, you know, behavioral stuff. They have beagles because they're probably a top three cutest puppy that you'd ever see. Like they're just freaking adorable, but they will wear you slam out They'll wear you slam out. And people don't think about that because people make emotional, you know, decisions. People are like, well, Josh, I want to get a dog. What type of dog should I get? Man, I don't know. I mean, any dog could be right for you. And every dog could also be wrong for you. So we tell people all the time, go online. There's several free quizzes you can take. Go through, answer some questions. And it's asking you about your lifestyle, activity level, how much do you work, how often are you gone from your home? What do you like to do in your free time? You know, do you got small kids? Blah, 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 blah. Ask you all these questions. And then it's going to make recommendations on the dogs that would fit into your lifestyle. Oh, I really didn't want any of those dogs. I wanted this other dog. Like that's a selfish, emotional ass decision that you would make. Because there's so much data out there that tells you about dogs and their, their personalities and energy levels and demeanor. And when you ignore all of those things because you like how one looks and I'm going to get this dog because it looks cool, but your lifestyle doesn't support that dog and what that dog is as a living being, that you buy it because it looks cool, you want to look cool, well, you look like an asshole, you don't look cool because you're putting a dog in a spot that it should never be in. It is absolutely amazing how, regardless of where the conversation starts, it always ends up with people are harder to train than dogs. <laughs> it is. It, it is. That is the way. So, you know, anybody listening today who's thinking about getting a dog, you know, do your homework. Do your homework on the dog. Don't get it because you like how it looks. Should that play into it? Yeah. Like, we all, I mean, you're probably with your, your partner, you know, your spouse, uh, significant other, because you like how they look. That was probably part of the, the process, right? There's something about them physically uh, that you were attracted to. You know, with, with my dogs, you know, I, I have labs and, and Rottweilers. I've trained yellow labs, chocolate labs, black labs, silver labs. Doesn't matter. I prefer the black labs. I prefer the Rottweilers. I prefer the Rottweilers with the docked tail versus the full tail, right? There are aesthetic preferences to those but i also know that those dogs fit into our lifestyle and what we're about even though rocky drives me damn crazy 80 percent of the time you know what i mean i just I, my house only has room for for um one personality my size rocky is a legend to to make it tough so yeah that's where we're at do your homework pick the right dog for your lifestyle don't pick the dog just because based on how it looks you know what i mean don't don't just do that because more times than not if you're making an aesthetic decision, you're making a poor um, decision. And so while I said those breeds for me were the dip most difficult to train, there are thousands of trainers that will tell you those are their favorite dogs to train. And amongst my team, you probably get 50 different opinions of if you said, hey, what are your top five dogs to train, top five you dislike training the most? You will get a list of every type of dog you can think of because we also have our own personalities and preferences. Yeah. Just the thing. Love them all. I just don't necessarily enjoy working with all of them. So and it's not the dog's fault. I mean, honestly, it's probably a me, a me thing. So that's it for the questions, right? Yep. All right, guys. We'll catch you next week on the Big Dog Podcast.